This hour of Hugh Hewitt starts right now on Salem News Channel. Hour one of the Hugh Hewitt Show straight ahead. We're going to be looking at the news. We're going to have a rundown. We are going to have another look at an inane speech by the infirm president, plus a look at the movies with Sonny Bunch, and our weekly delve into poetry with Tarzana Joe, the poet laureate. All this ahead on the first hour of the Hugh Hewitt Show. Don't want to miss a minute. This hour of Hugh Hewitt is on Salem News Channel. Joined now by the...
Portions of the following program may contain pre recorded material. Morning, Glory America. Bonjour, hi, Ken. It's Hugh Hewitt. Today is the big day. They're voting on the next chairwoman of the Republican National Committee. I'm down in South Orange County, California at the RNC, reporting back to you on Monday all about it. But it worked out so well yesterday. He wasn't arrested. We weren't canceled. So we thought, let's try it again. Generalissimo is back. Take it away, Dwayne. No, nobody got arrested, at least not yet that I'm aware of. Welcome back, America. It is Dwayne Patterson filling in for Hugh Hewitt today. Hugh is at the RNC retreat as a vote on their leadership for this coming term, and he will be rejoining us on Monday. Lots ahead on the program today. In Hour 3, we will be talking with Dr. Larry Arn of Hillsdale College, who will continue the Hillsdale Dialogues. And uh, this week, I think they're going to take a break from Churchill, and they're going to do current events, because there's a lot going on in the news. So he will be talking to Dr. Larry Arn about that. Uh, also in the program today, we are going to conclude Hugh's interview with Mike Pompeo, former Secretary of State, author of Never Give an Inch. The last of that uh, very lengthy interview will take place a little bit later in the program, along with an update from The Hill and Sarah Westwood of the Washington Examiner. Uh, she's got a couple pieces of uh, interest that we're going to talk to her about a little bit later. Uh, we're going to have poetry today. It is Friday. Tarzana Joe will be along with the verse of the week. Sunny Bunch will be along with movies, but it is time for the rundown. Uh, Memphis is on kind of a high alert status right now. Uh, five Memphis police officers were charged yesterday with second-degree murder for the death of Tyree Nichols, a 29-year-old black man, after a traffic stop that escalated into what the authorities have described as a display of staggering brutality. What makes this case different than previous cases is that all five police officers are also black. The officers that were charged... Uh, let me see if I can find their names here. I will find their names in a second here. Tadarius Bean, Demetrius Haley, Emmett Martin III, Desmond Mills Jr., and Justin Smith were all charged with kidnapping, official misconduct, official oppression, in addition to second-degree murder, prosecutors said. The officers have all been terminated as of last week. The reason Memphis is on high alert for tonight is because a little bit later this morning, Memphis is going to release the videos. And apparently the video is going to be stunning to, to see. It is going to be something that everybody is afraid is going to um, resort to violence in the streets. The mother of Tyree... Um, Nichols has already gone forth and begged the community of Memphis not to riot, to whatever they have to say, say it peacefully. Uh, it's going to be an interesting day, an interesting night in Memphis. So prayers for everybody there. That is going on today. The National Archives in the uh, try to get the horse back in the barn after the barn door is open department have now decided to ask all ex-presidents and ex-vice presidents to go through their files and see if there's things there that shouldn't be there. A little late for that, but the National Archives is Johnny on the spot. The FBI uh, finally got back to what the FBI should be doing. They shut down a ransomware gang that has targeted schools and hospitals. Attorney General Merrick Garland said the group called Hive extorted hundreds of organizations before getting hacked itself. Boy, you love karma in that department, don't you? The FBI and law enforcement in Europe have shut down a major ransomware operation accused of extorting more than $100 million from organizations across the world by encrypting victims' computer systems and demanding payments to provide a key to unlock them, U.S. officials said Thursday. Look, I, I have a, a kind place in my heart for a lot of people, not these people. They should not see unobstructed daylight ever again. I... I have no use for these people. We got hit by a ransomware attack in this studio, what was it, Adam, five years ago, six years ago? And it, it, was, it was a big hit. Are you going to pay the money? No, I'm not going to pay the money. We have to rebuild all the files. There's a lot of stuff we lost and had to rebuild. But I have no love for these people. May God have mercy on their soul because nobody on earth is going to. 
Uh, chrysanthemum flowers, a symbol of mourning in China, are now selling out in cities across the central province of Hubei with prices rising sharply as demand surges following a wave of COVID-19 deaths. Uh, a worker at a green plant shop in Wuhan, the provincial capital where the virus first emerged, said he is now charging the equivalent of $6.63 per basket, a 50% uh, year-on-year increase. Last year, we only charged a handful for a basket of these morning flowers. This year isn't comparable with last year. So many people died of COVID this year. It has now boosted market demand. That's one way to tell if the CCP is telling you the truth about what's going on there with, with COVID uh, fatalities. Gazans have fired rockets in the south of Israel yet again after a, um earlier attack in which there was some fatalities between the Israeli defense forces and Gazans. Rockets have started to fire into the south of Israel again. The two rockets that were fired were intercepted, thank God, before any innocents were injured or killed. The sirens were activated near Kafar Aza, a kibbutz near the Gaza border. You have to pray that we do not have another round of fireworks going off in Israel because of the violence on the border. More than half of Democrats, writes Sarah Arnold, in are questioning Joe Biden's mental fitness. President Joe Biden is facing a series of rough patches as he enters his third year in the Oval Office, sparking concern over his ability to govern the country from both sides of the political aisle. According to a Harvard-Harris 2024 survey, six in 10 respondents have doubts regarding Biden's mental capabilities, with 65% believing that the 80-year-old is just, quote, too old, end quote, to run the country. Nearly a quarter of those who say Biden is too old are Democrats, while 87% were Republicans and 67% were independents. Well, as long as we are talking about the age of the president and whether he is too old to do this job, let me take you to Springfield, Virginia, yesterday, where the president took the roadshow to give a union speech where he said this, cut number one, Jacob. Where in the hell is it written that says America can't lead the world in manufacturing again? Where is that written? I don't know where it's written. And it's not going to be on my watch. Ladies and gentlemen, we're getting, you see I'm getting criticized internationally for my, my focusing too much on America. The hell with that. I, I know. Nobody, does anybody want to call on me? I, I know where in the world it's saying that the U.S. can't lead in manufacturing. Beijing. Xi's office, China, it's all over there. Um, yes, it is written around the world that the U.S. can't lead on manufacturing and Joe Biden trying to get all righteously indignant. It just strikes a weird chord. Cut number two. It hadn't been with my case, but all of a sudden, blue-collar workers, all the guys I grew up with in Claymont and Scranton, they're voting Republican. Not a joke. What's happened? I think a lot of it because they don't think we care. We're not paying attention. It's a little bit like what happened when I ran the first time as a 29-year-old kid for the Senate in 1972 and got elected. We had what we called, what I call, limousine liberals. A lot of people wanted to do an awful lot, but they just forgot about my neighborhood. They forgot about the neighborhood I grew up in. We weren't poor. I'll bet you forgot that Joe Biden invented the term limousine liberals. I know I sure did. And you know why? Because he didn't invent that phrase. Um, he is, you know, he's, he's this generation's Walter Mitty. He's been everywhere. He has done everything. He has invented everything. He is... He, he, there's lots of things that Joe Biden in his head has done that just do not bear out to be true. Uh, the reason that blue collar workers are starting to vote Republican is because they're tired of paying taxes. They're tired of their jobs being shipped overseas. They're tired of a lot of things, primarily that the Democrats aren't the same Democratic Party they used to be. 
the blue collar workers don't like workers coming across the border because of a invite from the Democratic Party horning in on a lot of jobs. There is a lot of reasons why they're voting Republican. They have families and what the Democratic Party is offering does not meet what the needs are of the families of these union workers. More from the infirm president from Virginia after the break, plus a whole lot more news and Sonny Bunch and Tarzana Joe and all sorts of fun ahead on the Friday edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show. Dwayne Patterson filling in for Hugh Hewitt. We'll be back right after the break. Come back. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition. Go to myphdweightloss.com to learn more.
22 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Dwayne Patterson filling in for Hugh Hewitt. That's Rod Stewart, of course. The first cut is the deepest. Et to Rod Stewart. Uh, look, over across the pond, Great Britain has their own problems in their political affairs in Parliament. The Tories have not had a great run of it of late, and Rod Stewart actually is a conservative. He's actually a Tory. Now, you wouldn't know it of late because he doesn't really talk much about his politics, and it certainly isn't reported by media because he is a Tory, and so, you know, the media doesn't like that much. Except, of course, when Rod Stewart calls into a radio show and says that, you know, the Tories probably should stand aside and hand it over to Labor for a little bit because the Tories are making a hash of it. And when Rod Stewart says that, by gum, the media decides, wow, what Rod Stewart says, that's really, really important now. That's just grand. Thanks, Rod. Why don't you go, you know, take a little time off. Uh, Speaking of taking a little time off, I would like Joe Biden to take a little more time off because every time he gives a speech, it is uh, it's basically a train wreck. He was in Springfield, Virginia, speaking to a union crowd. And um, here's a little more of what the infirm president had to say. Cut number three. The deficit in four went up four years in a row, accounting for 40 percent of the entire 200 years of debt. You hear me? No president added more to the debt in four years than my president. I I misspoke. 25% of our country's entire debt. Nobody has added more debt to the country than my president. Um, no joke. You see, here's the thing. He was trying to say, but he's too feeble and inane to be able to put two sentences together. He was trying to say my predecessor. He's trying to lay it all off on Trump. Trump's the one that exploded the national debt. Him, not me. Go if, if you're if you're a debt hawk, go get him, not me. And to be fair, Donald Trump did in his four years add about seven and a half trillion dollars to the debt, or supervised adding seven and a half trillion to the debt. Did anything happen over those four years of consequence that may have? been responsible for that. Maybe in the last year or so of his administration, did anything happen in this country like, oh, shutting it down? And then when the federal government decided to allow people to go back and actually engage in commerce again, we had to wallpaper, the we had to hose the country down with cash just to kind of prime the pump and get it started again. Did that have anything to do with it? Possibly. Not saying that Donald Trump was a was was a budget hawk. He's not. He never was. I never made that claim that he was. But to be fair, if you're going to lay all this off on him, then let's talk about some of the the purported COVID relief spending under Joe Biden's watch. Again, he's trying to lay off all this debt on the last administration. Seven and a half trillion dollars worth. We are exactly a week into year three of the being there years. President Chauncey Gardner has got a track record now of two years. And in those two years, the national debt has increased by $1.8 trillion. That's halfway through. Now, you see, here's the problem with that. If you add in the $1.9 trillion that the American Rescue Plan, the ARP plan, is going to cost, by most estimates, and then you add in the half a billion for infrastructure that passed through Congress earlier last year, and then you add in another half a billion that is estimated to what the student loan forgiveness plan is going to end up costing you and me, you add all that up. And in two years, Joe Biden has given us about $4.7 trillion of actual debt piled on plus promised additional debt. So $4.7 trillion in two years compared to Donald Trump's $7.5 in four and a pandemic. I'm not so sure I would run on that, on that record if I were him. Uh, look, 
I'm not going to talk about the debt on the cruise. I am not going to talk about the debt at all on the cruise. I am going to talk about fun stuff on the cruise. When Hugh and Guy Benson and I go, we're going to talk about what's coming up in the 24 presidential election. But you've got to be on the cruise to be able to hear what we talk about in our Vegas meetings on the on the ship, on the Seven Seas ship. <laughs> Regent Seven Seas is going to be a very luxurious cruise. HughCruise.com is where you get all the information. HughCruise.com. And I have to lose a bunch of weight to get there. I have to, um, I'll, I'll talk to you about the, 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 the weight loss in just a little bit. But what I got to do is the Relief Factor spot. Because Hugh normally would be popping Relief Factor pills right now. And you wouldn't be able to hear him talk about the four magic ingredients. You wouldn't be able to hear curcumin, resveratrol, icarian, and omega. You wouldn't hear him being able to articulate that because he's choking it down with lukewarm coffee. I won't do that to you. What I will tell you is it does work. Because I've seen how Hugh can get around. I've seen him move around. He's 10 years older than I am, and he's more spry than I am. Uh, relieffactor.com is where you go to get the starter pack, 1995. I will be joined after the break by Sonny Bunch, our movie critic. And then we'll get back to a little more Joe Biden in the news. This is Dwayne Patterson filling in for Hugh Hewitt. We'll be back with Sonny Bunch in just a second.
Welcome back, everybody. Dwayne Patterson filling in for Hugh Hewitt. That music means we are joined by the resident movie critic of the Hugh Hewitt Show. That would be Sonny Bunch of the Bulwark Goes to Hollywood podcast, as well as the Cross the Movie Aisle podcast. You can read everything that Sonny writes and get links to it over on Twitter at Sonny Bunch. Hello, Sonny. How are you? Hey, Dwayne. How's it going? I'm doing uh, really good. I get to be in the big chair today, which is actually kind of fun. So well, I was going to say, is this is this the first time? Is this these two days? Are these uh, your your first time as as host? I have actually hosted the show over the course of the twenty three years that we've done this run. I've probably hosted the show maybe fifteen twenty times, but okay. Uh, okay. but of all those times, the studio was on fire. I mean, <laughs> like, like like there was something going on where I had to, or it was dead air. This yeah. is this well, this no, is it, a planned like, event. Well, because I, I I have never had the pleasure of uh, of being on with you before, which is why I ask. So uh, this is this is exciting for me. You know, okay, well, as, as much as you. So where I want to go with you today is I want to, uh, based on your recommendation, I took the wife last week and we went out and saw a man called Otto. Which was a really, really good movie. Liked it a lot. It was, um, you know, Tom Hanks, I was sold. It was not the comedy that I thought it was going to be. But then again, after your review last week, uh, I, I was going in with a little bit different expectations. I will note for the record that our friend Selena Zito used to live in that neighborhood, and her old house was one of the houses in that row where that movie was filmed, which I thought was, oh. kind, of, thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, but the fun part about that was when we saw the trailers for the first time since before the pandemic, Sonny, there were three, four, five trailers that all we looked at each other and went, yeah, you know, I think we can do that one. They, 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 there's actually some movies on the horizon, Sonny, for the first time in a <laughs> long time. Yeah, well, let me. I, I'm curious what, what, the, uh, what the ones that jumped out at you were. Okay, I'm glad you asked that. Living, this Bill Nye movie. Mm-hmm, sure. Uh, have you seen it yet? Because it, it's, it's one of those limited release, sneaking it in to get the Oscar nods, right? No, I haven't. I haven't seen it yet. I it, it hasn't. Uh, I don't think it is even playing around me yet, or at least not at my local, you know, AMC and uh, Draft House. It may be playing somewhere in Dallas. But the trailer not... looks spectacular. Bill Nye yeah. chewing scenery in fifties period London. I'm in. Right. I mean. He's a great sure. actor. Sure. Yeah, he's great. Uh, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Now, before everybody rolls their eyes at this one, you know, the adaptation of the Judy Bloom book, the thing that really jumped out at me in this wasn't the cast, Rachel McAdams and Kathy Bates, I think, are in it. But what struck me about this is one of the producers is James L. Brooks. And that got my attention because yeah. he doesn't yeah. make a lot of junk. No. No, he doesn't. He, he, he's been quiet recently, too, so it, it is always nice to see him back. Um, 80 for Brady. Now, this one I'm going to have to take. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to have to take this one for the team. My wife really, really wants to go see this because to her it looks funny. Um, yeah. it, it, that, is a, that is a very classic, uh, you know, kind of, uh, to, use, to use a phrase, chick movie. Uh, but you know, I think it. I, I think that there's a low key chance that's a that's a pretty big hit because you you never know. Um, a what's gonna what's gonna pop with crossover audiences? And it's one of those movies that you could possibly see like women and men both showing up to you know wives getting the the husbands out of the house is that, as you say taking one for the team. Is is that one you're gonna go see? Uh, probably not. Probably not. <laughs> probably not. Well, yeah. Okay, and then the uh, the M Night Shyamalan movie. Uh, <laughs> I know that's not how you pronounce it. No, uh, yeah. Knock Knock at the Cabin. What do you think about sure. this one? Well, that that's another one that I am I'm looking forward to. I haven't seen it yet because it, it doesn't come out until next week. Uh, but it is. Uh, I've read the book. Um, I will be curious to see if it deviates pretty heavily from the book. I've I've heard that it has a lot. Uh, yeah, I, I won't I won't I won't spoil it. Um, but I will say that if they made a faithful adaptation of the book, audiences would uh, would revolt. Um, so we'll we'll see we'll see what it uh, what what actually happens in the uh, in the movie. Um, but I'm looking forward to that one as well. I like Dave Bautista a lot. Uh, I think he's he's uh, he's great, and 
it and you know Shyamalan is hit and miss right there's anytime he makes a movie there's basically a 10 percent chance it's going to be one of the 10 best movies of the year and like a 40 percent chance it's, it's just going to be, gonna be awful movies right. of the year right so uh you know it, it, it he's hit and miss but I'm looking forward to that one as well. And then the last one that I saw that we have to see because I have a miscellaneous random person uh, mail edition that is a Marvel a Marvel person. And so every Marvel product we have to go see, whether we like it or not, we have to go see it because it is Marvel. The Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania. Uh, yeah. that's, that's, uh, that was the last trailer that we saw. And we kind of looked at each other and we had that knowing resignation uh, that that resigned uh, nod that yeah we're going to have to go see that one <laughs> yeah well i mean that one and it's it's interesting too because this is the first of the uh, the ant-man movies that really ties into the rest of the mcu right this is this is the first of these movies that like is moving the saga forward in a in a real way so i'm i'm curious how that how that works uh, for them it's also you know to talk about geopolitics for a second it's the first marvel movie that's going to be released in china uh as the same time as it was released in america since i think avengers endgame hmm. or may- maybe I, I like it's been it's been you know three years now four years now since uh, a marvel movie has come out in china and i had i had hoped they you know the studios had kind of weaned themselves off of the the chinese money we'll see what we'll see what this does so, Sonny Bunch, what uh, what is out there this week? Well, this week is, you know, this week's kind of a weird week uh, because it's the post-Oscars week, so you've got a lot of movies coming back in the theaters uh, that that had that got nominated for awards, right? Elvis, I think, is back in 800 screens. Um, I liked Elvis. If you haven't if you haven't had a chance to see Elvis on the big screen, uh, you should. It's it's good. It's you know, it deserves a big sound system and all that. Um, uh, the the only big new release is uh, a movie called Infinity Pool, which I do not think is going to be very uh, well trafficked by listeners of Hugh's show. Uh, it's a it stars Alexander Skarsgård as a uh, uh, a writer who goes uh, on a vacation to a resort town where he accidentally kills somebody, and he finds out in this. Uh, in this resort, that the only the the punishment for such things is death, right? Well, uh, as one might expect for killing. So, for kind of a someone. kind of a um, is it like a Stephen King book, or is it just kind of an original? Kind of, it's kind of like a, it's it's more sci-fi, really. Uh, so, the the hook of this movie is you can pay to have a clone of yourself reproduced. Uh, and the clone is the one that is killed in the in the by the uh, victim's family. Um, but it, it goes beyond that into uh, it's all you know a study of what does it mean if you live a life without consequences, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It it think, the movie thinks it's a little bit smarter than it actually is. It's fine. I enjoyed it uh, quite a bit. Mia Goth uh, gives this just insanely um, over the top performance as uh, the the. Uh, female love interest in this um and i i find her very amusing and entertaining uh, but it is a it is a hard hard r movie this is a hard i do not take the kids to this one uh no matter how much they beg to see infinity pool uh, i was to, to i was gonna ask, i was gonna ask you if it was more hitchcockian in its suspense and leaving it to the imagination no. or if they no. just flood this screen with blood everywhere no, it's it is a uh, it's very very bloody. Uh, you again, I would I would not recommend uh, taking this to taking the kids to see this. It's by Brandon Cronenberg, uh, who's the son of David Cronenberg. Um, you know, folks folks may may know David Cronenberg from movies like Videodrome and uh, more recently the Crime, Crimes of the Future, um, which I like a lot. Uh, but you know, uh, but the anyway, I, I can't I can't recommend it really. Um, Unless you are into, unless you are prepared for something that has lots of uh, nudity and violence, so you know, w- warning, warning to the wise. Uh, th- I mean, the other everybody's there's got yeah, there's, there's got to be right? something that you can re- recommend to normal people, right? Well, I mean, look if you if you want a if you want a normal uh, you know kind of prestige Hollywood picture, it's not even really a Hollywood picture though; it's a foreign film. Uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, which I think got 10 Oscar nominations or something. I was shocked at the number of Oscar nominations it got. It got a, a, a ton of noms, including uh, Best Picture. 
um, uh, which is on Netflix now. You can just watch it, watch it on Netflix. It's very good um, in a very traditional sort of way. I mean, it is it is a kind of traditional anti-war picture. Very very moving, very powerful. Uh, some great acting, uh, you know, some some very muddy cinematography, as one might expect of the trench warfare. Um, uh, but it is it is I it it is almost old fashioned. I am like almost surprised that it uh, it got as many nominations as it did. Old, old uh, fashioned yeah. in, in what context? In, in, in without well, giving just, away the plot, what what do you mean well, by? Old? I mean it's I mean it's all it's all quiet on the Western Front, right? It's a very classic story. It's not like it's it's a story that we've all we've all kind of we all have read and or seen the original movie of. Right. We know it, um, but. On top of that, you know, it just is, it is a very kind of classic, like, here is the ugliness of war. This is, you know, the, the brutal, um, you know, uh, awfulness of it all. I, I, good again, guys are good, good guys, bad guys are bad guys, and there's yeah. not a lot of nuance to it. Well, I mean, it's not even, well, it's not, it's, it's not that exactly. I mean, it, it is, it's more just like war is bad all around. You know, war is, war is terrible and mindless. And, you know, we're, we're the, the individuals stuck in it are thrown into the meat grinder, that sort of thing. Right. It's not, it's just, it's a very, um, I don't know. It, it is, it's the sort of movie that I feel like I am just surprised that it is, did as well as it did at the Oscars. I'll put it that way. I mean, I, like there are other movies I'm kind of surprised, but not that surprised. Uh, did well, like everything, everywhere, all at once. Got most uh, nominations last uh, of any movie last year, and um, I'm fine with that. That that's like a that's an interesting kind of uh, you know hip with it choice. It's very it's very with it, Dwayne. Um, but the but the you know again, all quiet on the Western Front. It's worth checking out. I don't love it. I do kind of respect and admire it. Um, if that makes sense, I, it's 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 just I don't I, I if you're if you if you're not going to go see Infinity Pool if you don't want to go back and see Elvis uh, if you've already seen you know um, Top Gun Maverick this is probably the movie for you to go check out uh, the other the other kind of surprise Best Picture nomination was Triangle of Sadness which I think is pretty funny um, it's a satire it's a social satire st- stars Woody Harrelson. Uh, first half basically takes place on Son- a yacht. Sonny, we gotta we gotta start to wrap things up. Um, right. We will we will come back next week and hopefully we can maybe sneak a a Bill Nye uh, showing in and, and and look at living. But you can get Sonny Bunch at uh, across the movie aisle and boat work goes to Hollywood, or you can see him at at um, Son- at Sonny Bunch on Twitter. Thank you very much, Sonny Bunch. I get to do an extra relief factor. Why do I get to do an extra relief factor today? Well, the only way I can explain it is because I did such a good pitch the last day. The, you know, the, the three pitches I did yesterday were so over the top that they ordered one more extra pitch. So here I am, yet again, to tell you about the four magic ingredients. Icarian, resveratrol, omega, curcumin. These four in an absolute perfect combination... When taken in the starter pack, if you get it into your system over a period of time, it will take care of the daily aches and pains. ReliefFactor.com, ReliefFactor.com. I'll be back with Tarzana Joe right after the break. Dwayne in for Hugh. Back in a second.
Joined now by the Poet Laureate of the Hugh Hewitt Show, the bard himself, Tarzana Joe. It is my distinct pleasure to bring to you the one and only poet of National Talk Radio here on the Hugh Hewitt Show, Dwayne Patterson filling in. Hello, Tarzana Joe. How are you? Hello, Dwayne. My pleasure. You know, Dwayne, you can't write poetry about classified documents three weeks in a row. Well, I guess theoretically you could, but I haven't. This is a more personal poem, and I think one perhaps you and other members of the audience can relate to. I had a pair of 501s. They were size 34. I wore those jeans a lot, but they don't fit me anymore. The last time that I wore them was in 1984. 501s are special jeans. They have a button fly. I'd see them in my closet, and I felt I had to try. I knew the odds were very long, like winning at the lotto. I swore off soda, bacon, beer, pastrami, and gelato. I kept those jeans up on the shelf to keep alive the hope. And every time I lost a pound or two, I'd try them on, but nope. I couldn't seem to make it work. I didn't have the skill and many pants and jackets I donated to Goodwill. My wife said, Joseph, give those up. I knew that she said sooth to me, but I held tightly to those jeans because they meant my youth to me. <laughs> then one day I found him, a man both warm and wise, a trader at a swap meet, and he had some in my size. I raced back to my closet, and I took them from their spot. I hustled to my hybrid, and I drove back to the lot. I may not be as young and strong or svelte as other men, but I am quite content. I'm wearing 501s again. <laughs> That's Don't Give Up on Your Jeans by Tarzana Joe. A spectacular... Uh, and, and I will have you know, Joe, I... <laughs> love this poem because I am in my standard uh, uniform. My uniform is the hue blue shirt, button-down blue shirt with the blue blazer, but I'm rocking the jeans uh, for, for pants as I always do because that's just how guys do it. Uh, I, I love my 501s. Very important poem. Very important. Uh, will, this, uh, will this poem be featured at Tarzana Joe anytime soon? Yes, and, and the people at Levi's are, are uh, they can pay me anything they would like for that poem. They can use it in their advertising uh, with a, a small honorarium. But yes, has it will the, be at Tarzanajoe.com. Has the Kraken been uh, released as to the commissions for Valentine's Day poems? Yes, uh, the, the world is full of procrastinators, just like your uh, humble poet. And uh, they started flowing in last week. So uh, keep those cards and letters coming. Tarzana Joe at Reagan.com is how you get a hold of Joe. And his rates are reasonable. They should be going up, but they haven't as of yet. Uh, but treat yourself to a really cool gift for that special someone. Tarzana Joe at Reagan.com. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Dwayne. I want to duck back into this Springfield, Virginia speech that the president gave yesterday and kind of close the uh, close the book on this uh, on this address. To close out hour one, the president repeated the same old canard that he has repeated over and over again. Cut number five. I've said this and we, I've kept the commitment. As long as I'm president, no one making less than $400,000 will have a single penny of their taxes raised, period. By the end of this week, you should have gotten your W-2. You should have started to get your 1099s. You are putting together your tax information to prepare for your return, to get to your accountant or to do it yourself if you are so disposed to, to do it by hand. And my guess is there's millions of people out there that are starting to put things together that are going to start putting together their taxes and realize, hey, you know what? I don't make $400,000, and I'm paying more this year than I paid last year. Joe Biden is lying. Well, he does that. He does that a lot. Uh, with regards to inflation, he's trying to say that everything is all better now. In fact, he said this, cut number six. We're also seeing American families breathe a little easier again. Are you breathing easier? Now that inflation has gone back down, have eggs actually gone down in price? Has gas gone down in price? They may have plateaued off and they're not increasing, you know, 10% over, over last year. Uh, 
but they're one or two percent over last year. And last year was eight, nine percent over the year before. Nothing has gone down in price. He's claiming it is, but nothing's really gone down. One more real quick. Cut seven. And by the way, families are going to save more than $1,000 a year in tax credits for these vehicles when they purchase one. And energy-efficient appliances like refrigerators and washing machines. If you can't afford gas, buy a new car. If you can't afford food, then buy a new fridge. I'll tell you one thing. I don't have to buy as much food. I eat smarter. I eat less of it. And I'm fine. That's what my PhD weightloss.com tells you to do. My PhD weightloss.com 8646441900. I lost 50 pounds on this plan over 12 weeks. Ate a lot less food. Didn't seem to bother me too much. Lost the weight, lost 20 points off my blood pressure. You can too. 8646441900. Hour two of the Hugh Hewitt Show, straight ahead. Dwayne Patterson filling in for Hugh Hewitt. We'll be back after the top of the hour break. This hour of Hugh Hewitt starts right now on Salem News Channel. What's on tap for the House of Representatives this week and next? We're going to talk to Sarah Westwood of the Washington Examiner in hour two. Plus, we're going to conclude the conversation Hugh had this week with former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, author of Never Give an Inch. Join us for the second hour of the Hugh Hewitt Show. want to miss a minute this hour of hugh hewitt is on salem news channel
Portions of the following program may contain pre recorded material. Morning, Glory America. I'm Hi, High Candidate Sue Hewitt. Today is the big day. They're voting on the next chairwoman of the Republican National Committee. I'm down in South Orange County, California at the RNC, reporting back to you on Monday all about it. But it worked out so well yesterday. He wasn't arrested. We weren't canceled. So we thought, let's try it again. Generalissimo is back. Take it away, Dwayne. Thank you, Hugh. Dwayne Patterson filling in for Hugh for the rest of today. Hugh will be back on Monday after going to the RNC meetings. Uh, I have a lot to do this hour. There is going to be the Hillsdale Dialogue in Hour 3. He will be back with Dr. Larry Arn. Sarah Westwood of the Washington Examiner will be along in just a little bit. And we will conclude Hugh's interview with Mike Pompeo, the former Secretary of State, author of Never Give an Inch at the bottom of the hour. But I want to run through some of the rest of the news while we've got some time together. Julia Shapiro over at The Hill writes... Mark Warner, the Democratic Senate Intel chief, along with his ranking member Marco Rubio of Florida, pushes for the Intelligence Committee access to Biden and Trump documents. They want to know what are in those documents, and they have a right to know since they have oversight. Tom Cotton vows to block nominees of all stripes until Congress sees the documents seized at the Biden and Trump residences. Tom Cotton wants to see what's in it as well. And he's willing to – remember how the Senate works. Everything's done by UC, unanimous consent, right? Uh, we move to open the session today without objection, so ordered. Well, Tom Cotton's going to object, which means they've got to stop everything and hold a vote. And if they get enough people to vote, then they can move to that piece of business. Okay, well, now we need to do this. Without objection, I object. Okay, well, now we have to hold another vote, and it just – slow walks everything to the point where some negotiation has to be done in order to stop that uh, stop that blockade. But Tom Cotton's going to be in the floor objecting to everything. Uh, my worst case scenario seems to be developing here in California. My worst case scenario being my choice for United States Senate in the year 2024 may be between Adam Schiff and Katie Batgirl Porter, and that may be my choice. I'm hopeful that it doesn't work out that way, but as of today, that's probably the most likely scenario, is Adam Schiff threw his hat in the ring, along with some other classified documents and Trump-Russia stuff, uh, and decided he was going to challenge Dianne Feinstein, whose body isn't even cold yet, and hasn't even decided whether she's going to run again or not. But everybody on the Democratic side is assuming that she's not going to run. And so they are going to primary her. Katie Porter is, and so far Adam Schiff is. There may be more that gets in. And because of Prop 14 10 years ago, California has this crazy rule where it's an open jungle primary. Anybody that's on the ballot is on the ballot. It's a nonpartisan ballot for statewide office in the primary process. So there may be 50 Democrats and 50 Republicans, your peace and freedom candidates, your independents, your whatevers, your greens, your Whigs, your your nutlog candidates, all everybody is all on the ballot in the primary. The top two vote getters, regardless of party, are who are, is on the ballot in the fall. And the way California is made up, it's about a 65-35 split Democrat over Republican, historically, over the last few years. So it very well could be Adam Schiff and Katie Porter are the top two vote-getters, and then they start throwing clubs at each other in the fall. What my hope is, now this is just kind of a fever dream. This is, this is a pipe dream. I'm, I'm uh, under no illusions this is going to happen. But my hope is... Republicans, I, there are some of you that are left in California. One. I only want one. I don't need 10 on the ballot. Just one. Put one Republican. Decide amongst yourselves who it's going to be. Put one Republican on the ballot for Senate and then have 10 different Democrats run. And you might just eke out enough of a plurality to qualify for the ballot in the fall. And we have at least a snowball's chance. That's my pipe dream. But 
there's going to be probably 10 Republicans running too to split the vote. And so they won't probably be able to capitalize on how that, how that thing works. Uh, in Florida, things do work there. The governor, Ron DeSantis, gave a speech yesterday. I want to play you a little bit of that speech. Here he is talking about Florida's crime rate, which even though you like to joke about Florida man stories, the crime rate is actually the 50-year low. Here's cut 10. The results been, well, right now, the state of Florida, our crime rate is at a 50-year low. Overall crime down nearly 10% year over year. Murder down 14%, burglary down 15%, uh, percent, and robbery down 7% uh, year, uh, year over year. Here in Miami-Dade County, uh, thanks to uh, the great work that uh, the men and women in uniform do every single day, uh, the murder rate dropped by 15% between 2020 and 2021 and dropped a further 38% through the first half of 2022. Uh, and so you have, I think, good policies in the state of Florida dedicated uh, to law and order. Clearly, the state supports the mission of what goes on, but you have folks with that support who are able to go out and protect our community. Uh, he also went on to talk about the fentanyl crisis that is facing all 50 states because of the uh, nonsense going on at the border. And Florida is passing a new piece of legislation that is going to step up the criminal liability is one faces if they trade and possess and deal in fentanyl. Cut number 11. Uh, we're also going to build up what we've done on fentanyl. Uh, we've increased mandatory minimums for both fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. But one of the things we've been seeing, it's very troubling. I mean, they will jam fentanyl into almost anything nowadays. So they'll actually do it uh, and make it look like candy uh, that's been dubbed a rainbow fentanyl. And then just two days in August, Customs and Border Patrol seized more than a quarter of a million multicolored fentanyl pills. And we're going to take action against this because this is really targeting our youngest and most vulnerable kids. Uh, this is not something that you can do and, you know, maybe you have some side effects, but you get over it. I mean, uh, you really could, the lights can go out uh, with these fentanyl overdoses and uh, the chance of a fatality is much higher than with many other drugs. And so we're going to make it a first degree felony to possess, sell or manufacture fentanyl or other controlled substances to look like candy and going to add a mandatory life sentence and $1 million penalty uh, if you're targeting children with this type of fentanyl. Bravo, Governor DeSantis. Uh, last cut I have for you on this is a, miss, a missive to rogue prosecutors out there. Uh, you, you, you omit the law and you, you avoid the law that you're supposed to be prosecuting and living up to at your own peril. Cut number 12. We've also taken a very strong stand against the idea that prosecutors can pick and choose which laws that they enforce. You know, our view is that if you disagree with the law in the books, run for the legislature and try to change it. But you do not get to be a law unto yourself. We had an example of that in Tampa, and so we suspended that prosecutor from his position. So Ron DeSantis is running, at, well, not running, he's governing as a law and order guy. And don't be surprised if he does throw his hat into the ring in 2024 for president. This is definitely going to be part of his agenda as well, bringing law and order back to the federal government. But that doesn't stop the media from just creating whatever narrative they want to create. There still is angst and wailing and gnashing of teeth in the media over the banning of this CRT class all wrapped up into a proposed uh, AP course that Ron DeSantis is saying, get out of here with that. We're not going to do that. Don Lemon on CNN got the vapors. Here is uh, Don Lemon, cut 16. Layla, thank you. This is, thank you. Poppy, this is bizarre. What? I know. What are I we, know. What are we doing here? I mean, this, I feel like we're going back. I feel like I'm watching a bad version of, like, Pleasantville, where you're, I, I don't get what's happening. It feels like the 1950s all over again with, like, book banning. This is, this yeah. is cancel culture 
from people who are, I guess they just want our kids to be ignorant and to control the teachers. It is, uh, this is outrageous. I, I, I don't, I really don't even know how to explain what's going on here. It's just ridiculous. He doesn't know how to explain because he's a dummy. Okay. He just is. Uh, the, the bottom line is the law bars books that have sexual content, sexual battery, uh, cross species sex, sadomasochistic abuse. Who could be against that except Don Lemon, who thinks we're going back to the 50s when he was born in 1966? It's dumb. Dwayne Patterson, in for Hugh Hewitt. We'll be back right after the break.
Welcome back, America. Bound for Glory, Tedeschi Trucks Band. Finest bumper music in radio, if I do say so myself. Dwayne Patterson filling in for Hugh. Good to have you here. Still shaking my head at Don Lemon. I, I, there is real stuff out there in the world to talk about. There is real serious stuff in, in the world to talk about. And he is getting his, his knickers in a knot over this bill down in Florida, which would ban inappropriate content from being shown and, and given to kids. And he thinks it's a flashback to the 50s book banning era. You know, there is an easy way around this for Don Lemon. He could, if he doesn't think there's a problem with it, and he wants to fly in the face of the people that are trying to ban these books, why doesn't he just read out loud, do a dramatic reading of, of, of these books on CNN one morning? He can't do that. And do you know why? Because CNN would be fined by the FCC for violating... Um, decency standards, and it's inappropriate content. There is a reason why parents all across the country at school board meetings and in public forum uh, sessions start to read from these books, and they get their mics cut off, and they get yelled at by the school board members, and they're not allowed to present from these books. Why? Because it's inappropriate content. But Don Lemon doesn't want to go down that road. He just wants to frame it in Ron DeSantis Republican. Ron DeSantis bad. He's not serious. There is real stuff to talk about. Like the U.S. dollar. The Financial Times writes today, the U.S. dollar hits reverse gear as the Fed seeds, seeds its uh, rate rise driver's seat. The dollar has weakened against all the other currencies for the last several months and it's there there is there is trouble on the horizon financially bed bath and beyond you remember that uh, chain of uh, stores that is always busy when you walk in and you have to wait an hour to get a cashier to check out but they are having banks cut off their credit lines and they are about ready to file for bankruptcy the Dow, IBM, SAP say they will lay off thousands of workers as belt tightening becomes a new business reality. Uh, Hasbro, the toy manufacturer, is going to cut its global workforce by 15%. We're not out of the woods yet. There's real stuff to talk about. That's why you need gold. That's why you need to hedge your bet. Look, Jeff Zients, the new White House chief of staff, he's... A wealthy guy, and there's nothing wrong with that. He made a lot of money doing all sorts of things in his life, but he's got a hedge against that because he sees that there's uncertain times ahead, so he's got a, a, a stash of gold. Now, I don't know if he uses birch gold. He should because they are among the best at managing as a third party uh, as, as a third party to, to house and maintain and store your gold. But that's where Hugh goes, and that's what Hugh has used for a long time is birch gold. Whenever he has bought gold, and we are into an era where you need to start thinking about, are we going to hit that recession? Are we going to hit that R word by the end of this year when all the other companies start laying people off? Birch gold is the place where you need to be. You can go to birchgold.com slash Hugh or text Hugh to 989898. That's text Hugh at 989898, Birch Gold. Last thing I want to do is my relief factor for, oh, I got to do, do my PhD. I got to weight loss spot first. PhD weight loss. I have been able to lose 50 pounds on this plan, myphdweightloss.com. I talked to Rachel, my nutritionist, two days ago and hadn't talked to her in a couple of weeks. She asked me how I was doing. Told her got off the scale. I was at 192. I've been able to hold within a five-pound range. Actually, I've been able to hold within a four-pound range for the last two and a half months because you learn how to do food better. You learn how to do your the, the way you eat and the way you look at food better and how you categorize in your head food so that it doesn't become a problem for you. And that's something I had no idea would be the case. I thought going into this that if you went to myphdweightloss.com 
or you called 864-644-1900, you would, you know, consume the products, lose the weight, and you'd be done with it. It's a learning process. You kind of change your behavior at, at the end of this process, and you shift into maintenance mode, looking at food differently, so you don't put the weight back on. 864-644-1900. Call today because you need to lose the weight, and they are the best people out there to help you do it safely. Now it's time for Relief Factor. Here is the green bag that has been here for a very long time. This is Hughes' emergency stash when he's at home base. I carry in resveratrol, omega, curcumin, the four magic ingredients that keep you able to go to all corners of the globe. He's got studios in the Northeast. He's got studios in the Beltway. He's got studios here. He's got another studio out here. He's able to jump around and get on the planes and go from place to place and go to places like the RNC at his extended vintage because of Relief Factor taking care of the daily aches and pains. ReliefFactor.com, 1995 is a starter pack, 1995, and get that in your system. And ReliefFactor.com will help you like it has helped you. Sarah Westwood joins us from the Washington Examiner as we come back from the break. Dwayne Patterson in for Hugh. We'll be right back.
We are going to play the last bit of the interview Hugh got to do earlier this week with Mike Pompeo, former Secretary of State author of Never Give an Inch. The book dropped on Tuesday, and Hugh got to have one of the first sessions with Mike Pompeo, spent about an hour with him, and we've been uh, tracking that back throughout the week. And here is the final installment how the interview concluded. Here is Mike Pompeo and Hugh. You know, the most important lesson in never give an inch, it's real politic, first of all. It's, it's about how to approach the world, but the other is how to staff an administration. And you have to make sure that people are going to be loyal to your vision, not too personally. But the people who will hate this book the most are named John Bolton and Nikki Haley. And the people who will say, ah, oh, that was fair, are Jim Mattis and John Kelly. But it all comes back to should anyone join an administration where they're not committed to doing the president's will? Because that's what an executive, you mentioned the unitary executive earlier. When did it develop the idea that you didn't do what the boss said to do? Nope. No one should join an administration without the full intention of executing the president's lawful orders. Uh, and, you know, I tried to do that my best every day, every minute for four years. We had folks who came in, by the way, I came in with deep understanding about some of these things, strong opinions. No one would have to guess what I thought about the nuclear deal with Iran. No one would have to guess about what I thought about a strong American defense before I came into the executive branch. But when I signed up, I took an oath to defend America. And that meant to work for the duly elected president of the United States who got 270 electoral votes. And he reminded me of that from time to time, Hugh. He'd ask me how many I got. <laughs> a few times. Uh, yeah. uh, and fair enough. But the truth is, uh, when you come in, you should make your case. Big fights are worthy. You should make arguments. But in the end, when the president lands in a particular place and says, go go do this, your mission set is to go back to the organization that you lead, whether for me it was the CIA or the State Department, and not to tell them, gosh, President Trump wants to do this. I sure don't, but we're going to go do it anyway. But instead to accept it as your own, to own it. That is now your policy because you work for the United States of America and its duly elected president. And we saw people who came into the administration that had different ideas, different motivations, and simply couldn't accept that central principle. So is the key the transition planning? You, you may be running for president pretty soon. In my view, anyone who runs for president should start planning a transition, no matter whether they're in first place or 20th place, because it's hard to stand up an administration. And the Trump administration, as a senior member of his family told me, screwed that up royally at the beginning. They got you, they got a couple other people who stayed four years, but a lot of people didn't stick around and were never committed. How hard is it to get that right, Mr. Secretary? It's very hard, uh, especially hard for conservatives and Republicans. Uh, we, we, we like to be in the private sector. We, uh, we, we're not people who love government. And so it's not, uh, and not for most of us, a lifelong dream to spend our life working in some bureaucracy someplace. So it's even harder. That makes it even more incumbent on conservative leaders, conservative presidents to get their team on the field. No, we did not get that right in the Trump administration. We were slow. We were late. I will tell you, and I write about this in the book too, we didn't get as much help from a Republican Senate as we should have at the front end as well to get our, our diplomats, our ambassadors, our assistant secretaries, our deputy assistant secretaries in departments all across justice, defense, education. We were late and slow. And so we were working with the previous team for far too long. Next president has to get this right. That there should be conservative organizations, and there are beginning to help shape what that will look like. Because the people matter, Hugh. You know this so well. Uh, that you have to have your people working in those places to actually execute the policies that are set forth. You're very careful to point out the Mary Kissels and the David Stillwells and the Morgan Ortegas and the Katie Martins, the people who helped you get it right when you got it right. When we look, and this is a global, it's not in Never Give an Inch. There are very important discussions of Susan Rice and President Obama and why they failed. There's a very important distinction between Ben Rhodes and the kind of people that you brought with you. Ben Rhodes being a nice creative writing guy who should never have been the NAP Deputy National Security Advisor opposed to the general you talk about. But what is their worldview, Mr. Secretary? Have you thought about, I'm not being pejorative here, they don't think like I think. Ben Rhodes is the Menedek of MSNBC. It doesn't make a lick of sense to me. What drives them? Goodness. Um, different things for different individuals. But there are some common themes, I think. 
um, they, they share a view, really a, a, a view of our country that is just fundamentally different than the one you and I hold. Uh, they, they think we're wrong a lot. They think we're the problem a lot. President Obama goes on what is essentially an apology tour. And they did that externally in Cairo, where he spoke about all the wrongs America had foisted upon the world. I just see it so different. They do it domestically. They talk about an oppressor class and an, a founding that is racist. Now, I think those views cause them to have a set of policies around the world that are fundamentally at odds with how you actually protect America. They're unprepared to use real American power. Think about what those tools are, Hugh. Real American power is certainly a strong military. Sign me up. But real American power is the capacity to use international organizations if and only if they're serving American purpose. Real American power is using American energy to deliver good outcomes for our friends across the world. Real American power is this unbelievable economy that delivers AI and semiconductors and blockchain technology in ways that no other nation can. When you tamp those things down, when you talk about profit-making companies as evil, or you talk about the United States as a force for bad in the world, you end up with a really different set of policies. And I think those are the ideas that animate the Ben Rhodes and the President Obamas of the world. All right, Mr. Secretary, you've been very generous. My last question is about the most important Pompeo, Susan Pompeo. Uh, I know Susan, and so the book does her justice. She's a marvelous, wonderful human being, and she's been at your side throughout and traveled with you throughout. And of course, the blob attacked her. I am curious whether Susan would prefer to reset and go back to being a congresswoman and spouse from Kansas, or if it was worth it. Because they were brutal to her. They were mean to her. They still are. It was all a lie. You lay it out. What she think about this? And congratulations, by the way, on, on giving props where they were due to your wife. Well, thank you. Uh, she is an amazing woman, a great Christian woman, full of grace. Um, she actually is better at me. I, I use those nasty adult words from time to time. She is so much better at that than me. Uh, no, she is a patriot too. You just like your bride is cares deeply about this country. She wouldn't trade a single second. Um, it was hard. Um, I, I shouldn't go after family. Um, so so I, I was more troubled by that than anything else. They could come after me and it wasn't such a big deal. When they came after her or my son, that was fundamentally different. But she wouldn't she wouldn't trade it either. She's, she's proud of the things we accomplished. Um, she was so happy that we managed to make it through the four years in a way that we think did good service to the United States of America. I don't think she'd I don't think she'd give it up in spite of all the heartache. I think she'd still say it was noble and worthy and important. Terrific. The book, Never Give an Inch, in bookstores everywhere, available at Amazon on the New York Times bestseller list. If it's not, they are, they're playing games because everyone's going to want to read this. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Congratulations on the book. Thank you, sir. I want to spend a couple of minutes now on a couple of different New Jersey politicians and just kind of let you see what unserious uh, looks and sounds like you've heard you just saw serious and you heard serious mike pompeo is thoughtful sober serious you may not agree with his conclusions but he at least looked at the issues very pragmatically and very openly and honestly and very transparently contrast that to somebody like Corey spartacus booker the senator from new jersey after a couple of shootings that took place in california and uh, cost a, a bunch of people their lives because of a you know random workplace violence in one case, and I'm not sure what the if we even know what the cause is in the other one. It was a Chinese uh, New Year uh, shooting in in the other one. Not sure what the motivation was yet, but after a couple of shootings. Cory Booker has never let a crisis go to waste. And whenever there's a shooting anywhere, you can count on Cory Booker showing up on MSNBC to make his pitch about why we need to take away all the guns. Cut number 14. One of the number one reasons, if you turn to our founders, that this nation was formed was for the common defense. And now we have more people in America, in my short lifetime, that have died due to gun violence than in every single one of our wars, from the Civil War and the Revolutionary War to the wars in the Middle East combined. This, this is uh, a, dele a, a dereliction of duty. This is a surrender uh, to uh, violence. Uh, this is not doing your constitutional duty to protect this nation uh, from threats foreign and domestic. 
Now, that would be a very stunning stat if it had any basis in truth. It, of course, does not. It's rhetorical overreach by Cory Booker. And if you are going to completely blow things out of proportion, why, I guess, apparently MSNBC is the place you go to be able to do it and not get pushed back on. Uh, here, is the, here is the cold, hard reality. He said in his short lifetime, there have been more Americans that have been killed because of gun deaths, shootings, than have been in all of our wars combined. Okay? Here is the problem with that. If you look at World War I, World War II, the Civil War, Korea, and Vietnam alone, not even adding the Revolutionary War, not adding the Gulf War, not adding Gulf War II, not adding... Um, Desert Storm, not adding, you know, what we did, you know, the war on terror the last 20 years. If you look at just those wars I mentioned, that adds up to a, a, a death count of 1,236,640. In 2019 alone, just to pick a sample, a sample year, there were 14,861 firearm homicides. Now, if that's an average year, and you don't count in that number, a lot of those are suicides. So it's not a person on somebody else's homicide. It's actually somebody taking their own life. But add it in. You'd have to be 83 years old to get even close to that kind of a stat that he is claiming. It's just not true. It's rhetorical hyperbole. It's over the top, it's overstated, it's not true, and he goes on MSNBC because he knows he can say whatever he wants to say and doesn't get any push, pushback on it. Uh, Frank Malone, or Pallone, is another guy that we will talk about maybe in the next segment from New Jersey who has some thoughts on energy. But I want to talk to Sarah Westwood of the Washington Examiner about what else is going on in Congress. She'll join us right after the break. It's Dwayne Patterson filling in for Hugh. You are listening and watching The Hugh Hewitt Show. Portions of The Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by Birch Gold Group.
Welcome back, America. Dwayne in for Hugh for one more segment. Then Dr. Larry Arn will join Hugh for the Hillsdale Dialogue. I am joined on the line now by Sarah Westwood, who is the political and investigative reporter extraordinaire over at the Washington Examiner and uh, rapidly becoming a good friend of the program here. Hello, Sarah. Good to talk to you. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me back. Uh, I want to play you just one clip from the House floor yesterday and get your take on it. This is Frank Pallone, who I believe he is going to be the ranking member of House Energy and Commerce from the House floor yesterday. Cut 13, Jacob. I um, don't disagree with the gentleman uh, from Florida in terms of prohibiting uh, offshore drilling, because I think that we should not have any offshore drilling for oil and gas off the eastern coast of the United States in the Atlantic or and, and even in some other areas. Sarah, where exactly does the East Coast get the uh, electricity from when they plug things in if they don't do any drilling at all anywhere near the eastern seaboard? Yeah, I think Democrats don't like to acknowledge a lot of the realities of how, you know, basic infrastructure, the electrical grid, you know, manufacturing, you know, another part of that conversation is how do they think that you know, the, the parts for solar panels and, and so-called clean energy components get made. A lot of times that's an even dirtier process yep. than just relying on that fuel as a primary uh, source of energy. So I, I think that the democratic conversation about this is often pretty disconnected from reality. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. That's why that's the, I knew that's what your take was going to be. I just had to bounce it off you. Uh, you have a couple columns uh, yesterday and today, and I want to uh, cover the one today first because that's uh, uh, more interesting to me. There's a turf war that's developing, and it's not even just in the House of Representatives. It's the Senate GOP is getting in on this, too, between the House GOP, the Senate GOP, and the District of Columbia. Can you explain to us what that's about, Sarah? Right. So to, to sort of set the scene, last week, the very liberal city council in Washington overrode the mayor's veto of a really controversial crime bill that gets rid of... Uh, life sentences, it gets rid of mandatory minimum sentences for people, yep. it lowers the penalties for things like armed robberies, carjackings. Uh, and that's coming at a time when the city is dealing with a pretty serious crime wave. So taking over some of the functions of the DC city government, which the constitution grants Congress the authority to do, vetoing some of the liberal stuff that the DC city government is doing, used to be sort of a talking point just of some House Republicans. There are some Freedom Caucus types who have in the past introduced measures to claw back some of what's known as home rule, DC's ability to govern itself. But now you're hearing from someone as, you know, establishment, middle of the road as Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, saying that the DC city government is going too far and Congress should potentially step in. So I think that's a really interesting development that very quickly Oh yeah. And those has moved from the realm of conservative talking points to, to, a, to a potential reality that Congress might take the step. So what would that step look like? What, 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 how, when, what kind of timing do you think that's going to be? Or, or, or is there going to be a hearing? Or how, what does that look like initially? Well, the problem is that both chambers of Congress have to approve it. So even if this is something that passes through the House, and potentially some vulnerable Democrats could be persuaded to get on board because, sure. you know, the the defund the police movement, the liberal criminal justice movement has proven they were, really unpopular. There's a lot of vulnerable Democrats up in 24, a lot of them. Right. And so they might, this might give them a way to take a vote that makes them appear independent. So, but yep. even if this passes the House, then it has to get through a Democratic Senate. But Mitch McConnell could force a vote to put Democrats in that tough position of having to vote to maintain a law that's almost undoubtedly going to lead to, to more violence and more deaths in the city. The other story I want to cover today is one that the rest of the Beltway is still reacting to from yesterday, and that is the National Archives is coming to the Hill, and they're going to sit down in front of uh, James Comer's uh, Oversight Committee. What is that going to look like, and when does that get started, Sarah Westwood? It's a pretty exciting development because it's the first interview of the congressional investigation into Biden's classified document situation. The National Archives has been less than forthcoming with the committees so far. They've said they can't share the information unless the Justice Department approves it. Obviously, the Justice Department is not going to grant a lot of sign-off. The part of why Comer is so interested in the National Archives is because the archivist 
was very cooperative with Congress when it was just Trump's classified documents that were under scrutiny. They wrote you know, a lot of correspondence back and forth, provided a lot of information, took a more proactive role in alerting committees about what was going on when Democrats were chairman. And now they've, they've been sort of slow walking information to the Republican led version of the House Oversight Committee. But nonetheless, the general counsel for the National Archives will be coming to Capitol Hill on Monday afternoon to sit for a transcribed interview. So that'll be sort of a starting point for the oversight yeah. to, be to construct a, a timeline uh, of when the documents came back into the possession of the government. Can't wait. That'll be fun. Ten seconds real quick. Do we know who the reporter was that Kevin McCarthy got into the scuff with a couple of days ago over uh, Adam Schiff and, and Swalwell uh, being bounced off of Intel? Do we know who that reporter was? Gosh, no, but I wonder if she or he felt <laughs> a little awkward after that exchange. I'm thinking that was Kevin McCarthy 2.0. Sarah Westwood, great work this week. Uh, We'll look forward to talking to you next week. You can read everything she writes at the Washington Examiner and see it on Twitter, at Sarah C. Westwood. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much, America. I'm turning you over to Hugh Hewitt, who will be back after the break, talking to Dr. Larry Arn with the Hillsdale Dialogue. Take care, everybody. On Monday. This hour of Hugh Hewitt starts right now on Salem News Channel. Hugh is back in Hour 3 along with Dr. Larry Arn of Hillsdale College as we do the Hillsdale Dialogues. They are going to take a break from their series on Churchill and look at the current news of the week because there is a lot of it of import. Something serious is afoot. As Larry Arn likes to say, all that ahead on the third hour of the Hugh Hewitt Show today. You won't want to miss a minute. This hour of Hugh Hewitt is on Salem News Channel.
Morning, Gloria, America, Bonjour, hi, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt. That music means it's the last radio hour of the week. The Hillsdale Dialogue is underway, and I am back. Thanks to Generalissimo for sitting in for me on Thursday and Friday when I was at the RNC meeting, and I have come back in order to talk to Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College. Hillsdale.edu is where you find everything related to Hillsdale College, and there he is on your screen if you're watching on the Salem News Channel and in your ear if you're listening on the radio. Good morning, Dr. Arne. Good Friday to you. Good Friday. Good morning. You know, you look much better. Obviously, the techies at Hillsdale have been working hard on your office. (laughs) I think you guys were incompetent. uh, No, I'm at home, by the way. This is my favorite place to work. Well, should take a tour of my study. I think it's wonderful. I think we see Charlotte in the background there. Let's get to it. We're going to do the River War next week and the week thereafter. But we take a break from our our year of Churchill as literary giant to pause every now and then to do current events. And the current event of this week is that the Republicans have taken over. Last time we did current events, Kevin McCarthy was the leader of the Republicans, but now he is the Speaker of the House. And uh, 